then we'll come back to deaths and our ciphers. So try the practice quiz, okay, and read read the exercise and, and try the two pieces of software that I point to, because next home or well, the actual homework, which will be assessed, which will come next week, requires you to use both of these pieces of software. OpenSSL is just uh, is a library for security uh, operations, encryption and other security operations. So we will use it throughout the semester, so you need to use, uh, get some practice in using it. It's a command line uh, application that allows you to encrypt things, uh, to do hashes and different operations that we'll need. VertNet is really uh, some, some very basic software I've created that uses VirtualBox to create a Linux virtual machine. Okay, because we're going to use Linux to demonstrate some things. Uh, and in your homework tasks, you will need to um, try and all use the same environment so that we can compare results and, and I can mark your submissions. Uh, so I have a, a virtual machine that you can set up. Um, and after the midterm, we'll start to use it a little bit more in that uh, the benefit comes in that we can create a virtual network. So we have, say, three virtual machines running on your computer and you create your own network inside your computer using VirtualBox. So try that. Um, and the instructions are a little bit detailed and things can go wrong. And the only way to fix them is really if you try them and if something does go wrong, then, then let me know. Okay? And we'll try and fix those problems. The, the result, so what you do, if you follow the instructions, you download some software, in, including a virtual machine that runs in VirtualBox, so only in VirtualBox. So it should work on any OS that supports VirtualBox, Mac, OS X, Linux. Follow the instructions, and what you get is a base virtual machine. I have in VirtualBox on mine, and then you run some program that creates that copies the base and creates some, some nodes for your network. And you can choose a topology. Uh, do I have pictures? I've got a set of topologies. That is, topology one is the simplest of networks. One computer, all right? It's not a network. It's just a single computer. We create a, a single machine, one we call them nodes. Uh, topology two is a, a network with two nodes. So what? will happen is it will create two virtual machines, running both running Linux, that will run on your computer using VirtualBox, and they'll be set up with IP addresses and in a network such that they can talk to each other across a simple network. And Topology 3 and the other topologies just get more complex. So Topology 3 is an example with three virtual machines. One we may use after the, well, we may use several after, up, up closer to the midterm and after the midterm is, for example, Topology 5, where we may run a web server on Node 3, a web browser or a client on Node 1. And then the attacker, the malicious user, may run some software on Node 2 and intercept the traffic between Node 1 and Node 3. And we'll do some, uh, some attacks by looking at a, a node that can intercept the traffic from others and a few other topologies. So once you set up the software, you can automatically create these topologies. That's what the software tries to do for you, where you just run some command that create a topology, choose the topology. Uh, what was topology? Topology 5 was the one we wanted. And it goes away and takes some time it copies the base virtual machine to create node 1. It, it starts it, tries to set up the network interfaces on the node 1, takes some time to boot, uh, to set some parameters, and it will produce some output here in a moment, I hope. It logs into the base virtual machine, uh, to node 1, and then it creates node 2. Okay? 
and does the same, sets up node 2 for you, so this is doing it for you, and eventually it will set that up and create node 3, and then you'll have three nodes, which are just three Linux virtual machines that can run on your computer. And then you can start them, and you have a virtual network on your computer. You can log into one of them, and it's as if you have running uh, your commands on a, on a Linux computer with, which is connected via a network to two other nodes. So you need to try this. Okay? We'll need it throughout the semester. We've tried it on a number of different computers and it, it finally works, so try it and then you can uh, start to do some of the tasks. So if I start, now start, say, node 1, I would need to start all three nodes, but if I start node 1, Virtual box brings me up uh, the, the virtual machine. And I can log in with network, network. And now I'm running on node 1, so I can run commands on here. And eventually, if I start no node 2 and node 3, I would be able to ping and, and log in to node 2 and node 3. And we can set up uh, whatever scenario we want. So try it. Again, next homework, you'll need at least one node. Okay? I'll require you to use a, the very simple topology of a single node. Uh, that's enough. Let's turn it off. And if you can then delete them. And if you want to create a different topology, you just run the command that creates a different topology. So that's one thing that you need to do. And the other part is use OpenSSL. And there are some instructions. You have some printouts and some links from the website that give some very basic introduction to using OpenSSL. And I'll show you some examples of that today. Okay. So I expect you to be able to try that yourself. I'm not going to provide uh, any more instructions in the lectures, but I can help you if you have problems, especially if you bring your laptop or show me a screenshot if you have problems. In our lecture, where we got to was looking at just listing, really, some of the symmetric key encryption ciphers. Uh, Sorry, and on, on the, virtual, the virtual network software, you, you run it on your own computer. Okay? If you don't have access to a computer on a regular basis, a laptop, a uh, home PC, then we've installed that software on the, all the, the Apple Macs in the other building on the third floor in the Mac lab. It's running on there, so you can just go in there when the lab is free, which is a fair bit of the time during semester, lunch breaks, after hours. Uh, some, some periods during the week and it's already set up so you don't need to install anything you can run VirtualBox and, and create the topology immediately okay. we listed some symmetric ciphers so going backwards the, the, one of the first Ones that became very popular was DES, Data Encryption Standard, but insecure because of the key size. 56-bit key means a brute force attack is possible. Triple DES, use the same algorithm, but use it three times with a different key each time. So effectively, the key is three times the length of DES. There are variations where you could have it two times the length of DES, so the keys were 168 bits, or even if you want, for performance reasons uh, or compatibility, shorter. So, no longer subject to brute force attack, but the DES algorithm, although se considered secure, uh, was slow compared to other alternatives. So, triple DES is three times slower because you apply the algorithm to encrypt the data, and then you would do it again, and then again. So advanced encryption standard was developed to 
be secure, of course, but also to pro provide some performance improvements so that it was fast for software implementations, fast in hardware and in different types of hardware. So it's very commonly used today, Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. And there are others. Okay? So there are many ciphers available. They have advantages and disadvantages. And then we said, OK, really, there are two types of attacks. Brute force, try all the keys. Cryptanalysis, use some knowledge of the algorithm to try and be better than brute force. So use a little bit of intelligence to try and find the key or the plain text without just trying all possible keys. That's cryptanalysis. So that involves, or the attacks are usually specific to the ciphers. Okay, so an attack on death may be different from an attack on AES. And we will not look at uh, details of cryptanalysis. Um, there are different types of attacks. They're very complex. Okay. Um, we may see a few examples through the course, like meet in the middle attacks. Um, but there are different uh, techniques to try and break the ciphers. With a brute force attack, we the measure of how good the attack is and therefore how secure the cipher is really depends upon the key length. Okay, because the key length determines how many times we need to try and decrypt our plain text to, or decrypt our cipher text to get the plain text. With brute force, in the worst case, I have a cipher text, I need to try all keys then the worst case is that I try the first possible key, I get some plain text, it makes no sense. I try the next key, I get some plain text, it makes no sense. So I keep trying the keys, and the last key I try, I decrypt, I get plain text, it's correct plain text. So I've found the plain text. So that's the worst case, where I have to try all possible keys. The best case, would be I, tr I choose a key randomly and I try it, ah, I get the plain text straight away. The average case is I try about half of the keys. Often we measure based on worst case. Average is uh, half, would take half the time as the worst case time. So how many attempts of decrypting do I need to find the plain text with a brute force attack? Depends upon the key length, so a k-bit key requires 2 to the k operations in worst case. Decrypt with key 1, try key 2, key 3, how many keys to try? 2 to the power of k keys, so 2 to the power of k operations. Of course, how much time, how much real time does it take to, to decrypt 2 to the k times depends upon the computer speed. Do you have just one computer doing the encryption at the same time? Or can you spread the tasks across multiple computers, for example? Or can you get a faster computer? That will impact on the real time it takes to break using a brute force attack. And I'll show you some numbers in a moment, some typical times. Cryptanalysis, again, we won't go into the details, but there are different approaches to try and break the algorithms. And the idea is to be faster than a brute force attack. Brute force is the worst case. So if we can do a brute force, okay, then we can break the cipher. Cryptanalysis aims to find the key or plain text faster than any brute force attack can be. If it's slower than a brute force, then it's, it's no use. I might as well just use brute force. So we want to be faster than brute force. So the way that we measure different security attacks on the ciphers is how many operations they take. If a brute force takes 2 to the k operations, but we have some other attack which is, takes less operations, then that's better. That's a better attack, and our algorithm is considered less secure. So the number of operations uh, an attack takes is a, a measure of how good that attack is, or in other words, a measure of how bad the algorithm is, the cipher. It turns out most attacks on real ciphers uh, 
to do them, you need a lot of, or you need some memory to store the, the data as you're doing the attack. So another way to measure how good an attack is, is how little memory it uses. An attack that is faster than brute force but requires uh, tens of petabytes of RAM to do the attack is not practical. But an attack that is faster than brute force that requires a gigabyte of RAM to do the attack is better. So it's not just how fast is the attack, but how much memory is required to do the attack. So it's another, another measure of how good the attack is. And many attacks make use of past pairs of plain text ciphertext. And I think we mentioned before talking about the attacker sometimes can discover, uh, uh, or they know about past ciphertext, but they've discovered the corresponding plain text as well. They don't know the key, but they know here was a ciphertext encrypted using this key, using some key, and the corresponding plain text. So they know a pair of plain text ciphertext. They can use that when they have a new ciphertext to try and find the plain text for that new ciphertext. And many attacks on real algorithms make use of known pairs of plain text ciphertext. Usually the more we know from the attacker's perspective, the easier it is to perform an attack. And we'll see some numbers about them in a moment. Uh, I think we'll go to a, a demo. Okay. Did we cover this? I think we've seen parts of it. I get confused. We're teaching this class and I'm teaching another security class and we're covering similar topics. So I get confused uh, what we've covered and what I haven't. But from the next topic on, I'll be covering different topics in both the courses and I'll be less confused. This shows brute force attack given a key length. Key space is 2 to the power of the number of bits in the key. And some worst case times, real times, given computers at particular speeds. So if my computer can decrypt at 1 billion operations per second, and these are the key lengths, and this is how long it will take to do a brute force attack. And there's an error. This should be five hours, not five seconds. So with a 64-bit key at 10 to the power of 15 decryptions per second, it takes five hours approximately, not five seconds. It's an error in the slides. You can see from 128 bits onwards, and less than 128, slightly less even, that with a computer that can do 10 to the power of 15 decryptions per second, a brute force attack is, is not possible. Okay. So the way to defeat a brute force attack is just to make your key length large enough. How fast is a computer? Can we do 10 to the power of 9 decryptions per second? What if I could do 10 to the power of 24 decryptions per second? Let's have a look at some examples. First, and you can try this on your own computer. There are different ways to measure. Uh, I'll do it on my laptop and then we'll show you some other data. This program that you're trying to use or you're going to start to use is OpenSSL and one thing that it does is well, it provides an implementation of many ciphers including DES, triple DES, AES. So you can use OpenSSL to take some plain text and encrypt with AES. Um, it also has a nice feature that can do a speed test. It will try and decrypt a lot of uh, plain text, random plain text, and measure how long it takes. And let's say we're using... I want to do a speed test on my computer. I'll start it. It, it. What it does is using AES as a cipher, a 256-bit block, AES has different options. CBC will come to later. Uh, but what this does is take some random plain text and encrypts using the AES cipher and measures how long it takes on my computer. 
gives many details, but the main output are these numbers at the end. And there are different ones, and it's not so easy to see, but focus on just one number, this one. What it says is that my computer, using AES, can encrypt and encrypt and decrypt are about the same speed, so encrypt or decrypt at a speed of 62,000, no, this is 62,000 K, so 62 million uh, plain text per second. Now in this case the plain text is 16 bytes. 16 bytes uh, a, a block, let's go back and remember, a block size of AES, so w what we do is we take 128 bits of plain text and encrypt that at a time. So a block is 128 bits, which is 16 bytes. So this is encrypting at 62 million blocks per second about, okay, on my laptop. So 62, let's say, just generalize and say 62 million encryptions per second my com computer t can do. 62 million is 62 by 10 to the power of 6. Okay. Can we go faster? Uh, Alright, that's my laptop. I've logged into my computer upstairs, which is a little bit better. Uh, let's run it on there. A speed test, same cipher. And it will take a, a minute or so to run. Different CPU, it's maybe a year or two years old, the CPU on my desktop. Uh, we'll see the speed it gives. So it just encrypts a lot, measures how or over three seconds each. All right, 100 million operations per second in this case. So a little bit faster. Turns out many CPUs nowadays have hardware support for AES encryption. So Intel CPUs have some built-in hardware to do the encryption. What was done then was all in software. Using hardware will be faster and to enable hardware I have some option, EVP which tells OpenSSL to use the hardware of the CPU to support the encryption. With the software I had about 100 million operations per second, now I'm using the hardware mode, 500 million. Okay, so five times faster by encrypting using hardware as opposed to software. So with my computer, one year old CPU, uh, 500 million operations per second. 500 million, 500 by 10 to the power of 6, or half a billion, 0.5 by 10 to the power of 9, which sits about here. Okay? All right, this is 1 billion. My computer is half a billion, so half this speed. So if I tried to uh, do a brute force on a 128 bit key, then it, wouldn't, it would take me twice as long as this. So 2 by 10 to the power of 22 years, still, it's of, of no use. So what can I do to be faster? How can I go faster? How can I speed up by brute force attack? Anyone? You want to break some cipher? What are you going to do? GPU, you use, use some faster hardware, okay? All right, number one, buy a better CPU. There are newer ones, generally faster, but not much faster. Uh, turns out um, the graphics processors on computers nowadays can do a lot of processing in parallel and can be much faster in some security operations. So they, the hardware, get faster hardware, basically. So that's one way, generally costs more. Okay, but, so you pay more for that hardware. The other way is to use multiple computers. Okay, I 
use the lab down in the other building where we've got the Macintosh lab and the, the network lab. About 80 computers in total I have access to run the attack, a brute force attack in parallel on those 80 computers. So 80 times faster than using just one computer. 80 times faster doesn't help much though. Okay, So instead of 10 to the power of 22 years, slightly less, 80 times faster is still uh, too long. Let's look at some data that people have collected about right, in different hardware and how fast brute force attacks uh, can be performed. I'm not sure if I've provided, I don't think you have this in front of you, but it's on the website, but it, it's just some, some examples, okay? Uh, first, some examples about DES. So DES was a used for a long time. It's no longer considered secure, so, but used in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and still used by some people today. But uh, DES with a 56-bit key, a brute force attack, two to the power of 56 operations. In 1998, uh, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, some people developed some, designed and developed some hardware to break DES. So a 56-bit key. Uh, it costs them less than 250,000 US dollars. Okay, expensive for you and me, but for an organization that wanted to break, uh, um, do a brute force attack on DES, not, not so much. And it did 80, million, or 80 billion keys per second. So this was dedicated hardware created just to break deaths. So my computer on AES was doing, what, about a billion or half a billion keys per second. This hardware on DES, a different algorithm, was doing about 80 billion keys per second. That was in 1998. And there was a challenge, break deaths, and they solved it in a, in a couple of days using that hardware. About eight years after that, so in 2006, what, that's eight or so years ago, another company or uh, universities in, uh, in Germany developed some other hardware using dedicated hardware, so FPGAs, programmed just to break deaths, okay, designed just to do deaths decryptions as fast as possible. And they could do about 400 million keys per second per FPGA. Okay. And they actually, so this is one FPGA, and they just put a, a bunch of them together. So they broke deaths in about nine days. Okay? And it cost about $10,000 at that time. And at that stage, a Pentium 4 was the typical processor uh, around that year. That could do about 2 million keys per second. So the dedicated hardware, one of them was at what, about... Uh, 200 times faster than a typical Intel C CPU. What about DES today? Well, people forget about DES because it's considered broken, but what, what could we do? Uh, assuming in 2006 our hardware could do 400 million keys per second per FPGA and cost $10,000, well, Moore's Law is some, some guideline that says hardware gets faster over time. It's, it's a bit more complex than that, but you know that CPUs get faster and faster. Okay, the technology gets better. And it says approximately the speed doubles every one and a half years. What does that mean? If I buy a computer today for um, 10,000 baht, then in one and a half years' time, if I spend 10,000 baht, the speed of that com my computer in one and a half years' time will be about double of what it is today. Approximately. Okay? Let's use this rough guideline. that About every one and a half years, the speed doubles. Which means for the equivalent price, uh, well, uh, to get the equivalent speed computer, the price is reduced by half. 
then you can do the calculations. So between 2006 and 2013, seven years, so every two years, or every one and a half years it doubles, which means it becomes half as cheap every one and a half years to, to do the same operations. Meaning it would cost you a couple of hundred dollars to buy hardware to break DES today. Trivial for anyone. Okay. So DES is broken. It had a 56-bit key. What about AES, okay, which is the standard today? And AES allows different key lengths. So AES-128 is common, 128-bit key. The same people who developed this hardware to break desks have improved the hardware to develop for AES. So they've created something called Riviera. Uh, again, it uses FPGAs, and I've looked up some data, and you don't have to know these details, but they've got FPGAs that about $100 each. Okay, you buy the, the piece of hardware, about $100 US dollars, and it can do a brute force on AES with 128-bit key at about 500 million keys per second, okay. which is per one FPGA and they also measure how much power it consumes because power is also an issue when you have a lot, lot of hardware. Of course you can use multiple FPGAs for example I think that their, their piece of hardware supports 128 of these not just one you just plug in 128 of them. There's an attack on AES a cryptanalysis Cryptanalysis, it's called the Byclique attack. We don't understand how it works, but it's an attack that's slightly faster than brute force. And they've implemented it and it can do about two times the speed of brute force, so almost a billion keys per second. So that's some hardware that you can get today that will try to break AES. So one FPGA about 500 million keys per second and it cost about a hundred dollars. Their, their, their device, this Riviera device, supports up to 128 FPGAs. So 128 times a hundred dollars is what? Twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. Maybe there's some extra costs. Let's say the cost of this device is fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, so uh, I go with $15,000 to buy this device. It has 128 FPGAs. They're all doing about half a, a billion keys per second on AES. AES, brute force, there are 2 to the power of 128 keys that we need to try. With 128 FPGAs, we can do about 64 billion keys per second. Where do I get that number from? One FPGA can do half a billion keys per second. So 128 could do 64 billion times by 128. Half times 128 is 64. So this box with 128 FPGAs can do about 64 billion keys per second. And it costs about $15,000 today. So how long would it take to do all 2 to the power of 128 keys? 1.7 by 10 to the power of 20 years. Still impossible brute force. Okay. So this is with dedicated hardware, about $15,000. Uh, that's how long a brute force attack on AES would take. Let's say I could spend more money. I had $15 million. I'm a company, I want to break AES. I have $15 million to spend. Then I can buy a thousand of these devices. Okay. Each one is 15,000, so I buy a thousand of them and get them breaking AES all at the same time in parallel. So I'd be a thousand times faster to break AES, which is what? 10 to the power of 17 years. Let's say I'm a government and I have 15 billion dollars to spend. 
than 10 to the power of 14 years to break AES. So even at this uh, price, brute force is not possible. That's a brute force. There's a, some attacks known on AES which are slightly faster. The bi-click at attack is one of the, uh, the best known ones. Brute force requires 2 to the power of 128 keys to be attempted. This at attack is slightly faster. It requires equivalent of 2 to the power of 126 operations, which is what? Four times faster. Because 2 to the power of 126 times 2 is 2 to the power of 127, times 2 again is 2 to the power of 128. So it's four times faster. What's four times faster than 10 to the power of 20 years? Well, it's almost the same. It makes no difference in terms of time. So even with this best known attack, four times faster is, is nothing when we're talking about uh, billions of years. In fact, this attack, although it's four times faster, it uses a small amount of memory. That's not prob a problem. Two to the power of eight, 256, so trivial amount of memory. That's not a problem. That's good for the attack. But it requires 2 to the power of 88 known pairs of past plain text ciphertext. That is, somehow the attacker has intercepted past ciphertext values and has learned the plain text, but they don't yet know the key. Now they've intercepted a new ciphertext and they're trying to find the key or the plain text. So this attack, in theory, requires the attacker to know 2 to the power of 88 past ciphertext plaintext values, which is impossible. You calculate 2 to the power of 88, and it's a very, very large number. So it assumes the attacker knows all this past information. So the attack, in theory, is possible. In practice, the attack on AES, cryptanalysis, is not possible. Okay? A AES is considered secure. Do I have one more? What about I encrypt my data today using AES 128, 128 bit key? And I, it's very secure data. I want it to be secure for the next 15 years. If someone breaks it in 10 years' time, then that's bad. Okay, so I want my data to be encrypted and no one can break it in the next 15 or 20 years. How long would AES 128 take? in 15 years time, in the year 2028. Assuming our computer's speed double every one and a half years, then the cost halves every one and a half years. And in 2028, if my, I have $15 billion to spend, then it will still take me 100 billion years to do a brute force to do a by click attack. Okay. Assuming there's no better attack developed, the attacks will still not be successful in 15 years time. That's with AES with a 128-bit key. AES also supports a 256-bit key. That's the demo I gave on my computer before. That's how long it would take to break AES with a 256-bit key. So again, these values, uh, even if there's a 1,000 times improvement in the speed of computers, doesn't help. All right? 100 billion years down to 100 million years to break it. Even if you have 1,000 times as much money, it doesn't help in the attack. So brute force and, and the known attacks on AES are not in practice successful. AES is considered secure. DES is considered insecure because of brute force. So just an example putting into context with current hardware and with future hardware, still these algorithms are considered secure. 
Again, you don't have these slides in front of you, but you can find them on, on, on the website. It's just an example. You don't need to remember all these values, but just understand uh, brute force, how to determine how long it takes to do a brute force attack. Any questions before we move on? Next topic. Still in cryptography, but slightly different. So don't don't uh, think, okay, I'm going to get my super fast computer with, with two GPUs and, uh, and try and break AES because unless you have a long time to wait, you're not going to do it. Now, uh, okay, yeah. How about we use cloud? A cloud, yeah. okay. Also, we not to spend on, on the, the buying the hardware, so we the, the you loan the cloud. Yeah. I, th I think the cloud still requires, so you use Amazon. Amazon provides a service where you can essentially rent their hardware yeah. for some period of time. You still need to pay for that. Okay, you, you don't, they don't give you the hardware for free. Uh, it may be a little bit cheaper in some cases, but okay, let's say using Amazon is a million times cheaper than using my own hardware, and it's not, okay, but let's say it was a million times cheaper, then in 15 years time a, an attack a million times cheaper would cut it down to 100,000 years to break. Still, 100,000 years, who's going to wait? And, and the, using the cloud is just you, using other people's hardware. You still need to pay for it. Okay? It doesn't improve. I mean, the order of magnitude it may improve by, even if it's double the speed, okay, or you have a computer that is double my speed, then you halve the time. Okay, double the speed halves the time. So instead of 100 billion years, 50 billion years of no, no impact on, on the end result. Okay. Halving the time reducing the time by a factor of 1,000 still doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, okay, so can you make your hardware go faster? For, for encryption, usually the, the best way to get the hardware to do the the encryption operations as fast as possible is to program the hardware to do it. Okay? You saw the example uh, on my, my PC upstairs in my office. Uh, this was a speed 100, 100 million per second when it was just done in software. Okay, so using the CPU, normal instructions, the software does it. I mean, using the, the, the normal instructions of the CPU. But many CPUs nowadays have special instructions to do AES, encryption and decryption. And the second example down here was when I used the special features of my Intel CPU to do AES encryption. And it's five times faster of when you use the normal features. So that's an example of when the hardware is programmed to do encryption, we can be much faster than it when it's general purpose hardware. So this was five times faster if you use some feature of a GPU that is programmed to do encryption, then it can be faster. Okay? Um, but still, five times faster, what, 100 billion years down to 20 billion years. No, no importance no practical impact. Any other questions? So yes, we can get faster hardware, but the numbers we're talking about, it makes no difference. And that's what we, we spoke about. We, with those examples. Uh, this 
this gives some details, and we're not going to investigate, but some an attacks on different block ciphers, which are the best known ones. The best known attack on DES is brute force. The time it takes depends upon the key size, or 2 to the 56 operations. So we don't measure time in seconds, but the number of operations, really. All right, how long does it take in real time depends on our hardware. Triple DES, the key size is 168 bits, but there are attacks that mean that you can do much faster than a brute force of trying 2 to the 1 168 values and a man in the middle attack can reduce the time down to 2 to the power of 111 operations much much faster and there are other attacks so this method by some person by by Lux 2 to the power of 113 operations with AES 128, the attack that we gave some data for, AES with 128-bit key requires 2 to the power of 128 operations in a brute force attack, but this attack brings it down to 2 to the power of 126.1, okay, about four times faster. But the problem is, in theory, the attack requires the attacker to know a lot of past plain text ciphertext pairs to the power of 88 values. And there are other attacks, but they're the best known ones, at least in the last couple of years. Maybe there are attacks that we don't know about, that some secret government organization knows. But in general, a lot of smart people work on trying to determine attacks on these algorithms. And the best we can assume is that the smart people know about them and have published uh, their attacks. So even if there are some government organizations working on attacks, people still think AES is secure. Okay. And it's still trust, trusted. Block ciphers, the algorithms we've talked about, are designed to operate on a, either 64 or 128 bits at a time. What they do is you have a large plain text to encrypt, say a one megabyte file. To encrypt with AES, it operates on 128 bits at a time. It takes the first 128 bits, encrypts, it gets 128 bits of ciphertext. Then it takes the next 128 bits of the plain text, encrypts with the same algorithm, the same key, and gets the next 128 bits of ciphertext. And so it, we talk about blocks that it operates on. Now, if you just split the plain text into blocks of 128 bits, encrypt each one separately, and then just the ciphertext you take by combining those uh, outputs turns out that you can do attacks on the output ciphertext. So there's things called modes of operation that define the ways in which you, if you have a long plain text, you break it into blocks, you encrypt a block at a time, how do you combine the ciphertext blocks on output to get the final ciphertext? And we will not look at all of them I uh, will just give you two examples. They're called modes of operation. And these are a list of some common ones. ECB, electronic code book, CBC, CFB, and others. Uh, they have benefits in terms of some are more secure than others. Some can be implemented faster in hardware. Uh, some have some problems with when errors occur. I don't think we'll spend any time on, much time on it in this course. If you want to see that, you need to sit in our security and cryptography course. Uh, this is a, a diagram that shows one common example of these modes of operation where we have a long plain text. We break that into blocks. So the first block, the second block, the third block, and so on. OK? 
okay? 128 bits at a time, for example. We take AES, that's our cipher. We take the first block of plain text. We perform some exclusive OR operation with some initial value called the initialization vector. So something chosen by the user. We take the output, encrypt with AES using our key. We get some ciphertext block as an output. We take that value and use it as an input to the XOR with the next plain text block. Use AES again, same key, encrypt and get our ciphertext out and take that value and use it as the input. So we do some chaining between the different blocks. We take the output of one encryption and use it to XOR with the input of the next encryption. So we get cipher block chaining. And the resulting ciphertext is just a concatenation of all the output blocks. I'm not going to explain any more on that. Uh, we'll skip over that. But I just had to mention it because you saw in our demo, whenever you use a cipher in practice, you need to choose a mode of operation. And in my example, I chose to use the cipher AES, 256-bit key. AES can use different key sizes. And the CBC, the cipher block chaining, is the mode of operation. Usually, there'll be some default mode. Okay. CBC is common. There are others, though. But it's really a way to handle large plain text inputs. Another example. But let's move on. Stream ciphers. So block ciphers. We take a block of, say, 64 bits of plain text or 128 bits, encrypt with our cipher, get our cipher text output, maybe combine it in some way and get our, our results. Stream ciphers are really designed to be faster. Faster to be, to be implemented so they run faster when we encrypt. And what they do normally is operate on one byte at a time. So think of our block size as a byte, 8 bits, not 64 bits. And the general approach of a stream cipher is that we have our plain text. You think of a stream, a continuous sequence of bits of plain text. It makes sense when we have, for example, um, some real-time communications. I'm talking on a, a, a phone and I want the voice to be encrypted. So as I speak, the codec on the phone generates bits representing my voice. Then a stream cipher may take those input stream of bits and encrypt them and sends the ciphertext across the, the network. So the idea was that stream, stream ciphers can be fast so that when you have real-time applications, when you need small delay, that they don't take long to encrypt. The general mode is that we take our plain text, we have a key, and we have some function that generates pseudo-random bytes. We'll see random numbers later, but just think random values. Somehow generates random values. And it generates random values, and our plain text is simply XORed with the random value to get our ciphertext. XOR is very fast to implement. An exclusive OR in hardware and software is very fast. DES, AES, generally quite slow to, to, to execute. Uh, so an exclusive OR operation is fast and secure. The Security of stream ciphers depends upon how to generate these random values. And it's not easy to always generate random values. Nowadays, sometimes there's not much difference in terms of the speed of a stream cipher versus a block cipher. Let's see if we can find an example. Uh, on my computer before the demo, I Using AES, I got 100,000 using the software mode, 500,000 using the hardware mode. A stream cipher is RC4. 
Let's see if it works. RC4 is an example of stream cipher, quite old, but uh, let's see how fast it takes to encrypt using RC4. So 100,000 and 500,000 using specialized hardware. All right, using RC4, using just software, not using the specialized hardware, almost 500,000. Okay. So in software, using this, the normal CPU instructions, RC4, a stream cipher, 469,000 K in this case, so is um, about five times faster than my AES using just software. Although nowadays with the special hardware support for AES, this is a little bit slower than AES. So sometimes stream ciphers can be faster than block ciphers, but when you have special dedicated hardware, block ciphers can actually be quite fast. RC4 is, was used in wireless LANs. It's used in some internet uh, applications. It's still used quite widely. There are some limitations of RC4 though that uh, if it's used wrong it can be insecure. Just one example. Let's move on. The last 20 minutes, let's look at a new concept. We looked at symmetric key encryption, taking data, encrypting, where both entities use the same key. They both use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. That's mainly for data confidentiality. I want to have a file that no one else can read unless you have the key that I encrypt it. Let's look at a different service. Authentication. I want to make sure that the file that I receive or the message I receive come from the person who uh, they say they are. I want to check that the, the source is not pretending to be someone else. How do I authenticate information? There are different ways. So authentication. The receiver wants to verify Usually two different things, or it can be two different things. I want to verify when I receive a message that the message has not changed. Someone sends me a message, I receive that message. I want to make sure that no one in between changed the message. Okay, I want to make sure I have data integrity. That's one form of authentication, sometimes data authentication. Authenticate the data I receive. The other thing is I want to make sure that when I receive a message, and the message says this is from Dr. Tanarak. I want to make sure that it's actually from him and not from a student pretending to be him. I want to verify that the source is who they claim to be. Okay? We use similar concepts to do both of these. And there are different ways to do it, and the four main ways. We can use symmetric key encryption, the techniques we just spoke about. Uh, Yep, and we'll explain how to do that in a moment. But we, so we can use the AES, we can use DES, we can use RC4, we can use the normal ciphers to provide this service of allowing the receiver to verify the message that they receive. But there are other approaches which sometimes are faster or more convenient. And we'll talk about message authentication codes, MAC, and hash functions. So we'll talk about how we can use them. And related to them, later we'll see public key encryption, digital signatures. So always think now, you receive a message. How do you know that the message hasn't been modified and that it comes from someone uh, or comes from who it, they claim to be? How do we use symmetric key encryption to do that? Here's the case. The source message, M, is sent to the destination. And remember, the goal of the destination is to make sure that it came from the right person and it hasn't been modified. So the source takes the message, encrypts, let's say using AES, and some shared secret key, K. They get the ciphertext. They send the ciphertext across the network. So 
Mathematically, we think of the ciphertext as the in we encrypt the message using key K. The receiver decrypts the ciphertext. So ciphertext is the input. D is the decryption operation. Takes the same secret key K and gets the message back. This provides data confidentiality in that if someone intercepts this, okay, someone listens in and they receive the ciphertext, if we have a strong cipher, they shouldn't be able to get the message because it's encrypted. And we assume now if we have a strong cipher, if an attacker doesn't have the key, then, well, what can they do? With AES, they can try brute force attack, try all possible keys. We know it takes too long. Try some other attack, again, takes too long. So an attacker cannot read the message in this case. But does the receiver know that this message came from, let's say, call them A and B? Does B know that the message came from A and it didn't come from someone pretending to be A? Do we provide authentication with this? And how? Yes? Good, because this is what the slide's about. How? Okay, good. The assumption of symmetric key encryption is that, okay, I haven't lab labeled them. This is A and this is B. Okay, user A, user B. Symmetric key encryption assumes A and B have the shared secret key K. Okay, only A and B know K. If someone else knows it, it's not secret. Okay. So user A encrypts with K, sends the ciphertext, B receives the message and they know that only user A is the only other person that has the key K. So if this message successfully decrypts using key K, then B knows it must have been encrypted by someone who knows K. And the only other person who knows K is user A. If user C tried to send a message pretending to be from user A, tried to send a message to B, so user C sends a message, they encrypt it with some key. But they cannot encrypt with this key K because user C doesn't know the key K, so they encrypt with some other key. If B thinks the message is from A, then they'll decrypt with the key shared with A and it will be unsuccessful in the decryption. Let's see if we can draw that. Maybe it'd make more sense. Uh, see what an attacker can do and see why the attack would be unsuccessful. So let's label the users. Um, so we have A sending a message to B and what do they send? In the normal case, they send a message using the same notation as before. They send the ciphertext, which is in fact let's call the key instead of K, let's call it KAB, subscript AB. That's the same as the previous diagram where A has a message, they encrypt with some key and send the ciphertext, the encrypted form of that message, to B. Where the key, KAB, I denote as the key shared between A and B. Only A and B know this value. B decrypts. So the operation that B does, message came from, so the source. Who's the source of this message? is A. From B's perspective, they receive the message from A, so for, therefore they use the key. What key do they use? Well, the key that they've shared with user A, KAB. And therefore to decrypt, they do the operation decrypt the ciphertext with KAB.
So B receives a message. The message says it came from A. Therefore, B uses the key that it has shared with A, KAB, and decrypts the received message C using KAB. And since C was encrypted with KAB, B will receive the message. I'll get the original message back. It will successfully decrypt. That's the normal operation. Now let's see what an attacker can do. And I will not call them C because we already have a C in here. Let's call them D. No, we have a D. We have an E. Let's call them F. Even better, M for a malicious user. Let's consider the case that we have, of course, A. B, and we have some other users, M, the malicious user, the attacker. And instead of A sending the message to B, it's in fact the malicious user sending the message to B, pretending to be A, a masquerade attack. What do they send? Uh, no, let's... Let's do something different, sorry. Oh no, no, we'll do this attack first. So they send ciphertext. Why did I use M? Let's call them MAL, malicious mal. They have some message they send to B and they wanted to pretend to be A. Okay. So they encrypt the message with some key. What key do they use? Well, they choose some key. Okay, let's call it the key of the malicious user. Send it to B. B receives a message. B thinks the message is from A. Okay. The source from B's perspective is user A. It doesn't know it's from the malicious user. That's the attack. Therefore, what key does B use to decrypt? Anyone? And I'll go back to the first case. Yep. Malicious user. No. I don't know they're a malicious user. So the, si the scenario is that in the first case, B receives a message from someone. Okay. In the message, remember the emails last week? I received an email and the from address gave someone's name. So I receive a message and the from address says A. Okay, in this first case, the source is A, from B's perspective. I think this is from A. Let's check. I think it's from A. Therefore, to decrypt, I will use the key that I shared with user A, which is, I'm B, I shared with user A, K-A-B. Okay, that's the key I've shared with user A. So I decrypt the message I received, the ciphertext, using that key, and in this first case, it would be successful decryption because the ciphertext was indeed encrypted with that same key. If a message is encrypted with one key, it will only successfully decrypt with that same key. So in this first normal case, this decrypts and we get the message as the output. That works. But in the attacking case, what happens? B receives a message. The message says from A. Okay. So from B's perspective, the source is A. Therefore, the key I will use to decrypt is KAB. I think it's from A. I am B. Therefore, use the key that I shared with A. So what I do is I take KAB and I decrypt the received ciphertext. So I receive some ciphertext message. I decrypt using KAB. Will that decrypt work successfully? Will I get original plain text out as the output? 
No, because in fact the ciphertext was created by encrypting the message, some plain text, with a different key. The key of the malicious user pretending to be A. And the, the nature of uh, our encryption algorithms is that if we, in, if we decrypt with the wrong key, then the output will not make sense and we'll be able to detect that this is the wrong key or the wrong uh, message. That is, we can detect if the key is wrong. If we decrypt with the right key, in this case the right key was the key that uh, was used for encryption, we'll get the plain text. So what happens in this case, B tries to decrypt and sees there's an error. Usually the software will say when we decrypt with the wrong key, it will say error, did not decrypt. And B will detect, okay, did not decrypt, something went wrong. Maybe there's someone pretending to be A. In this case there is. So for a malicious user to pretend to be A in this case, they need to know KAB. But our definition is that KAB is only known by A and B. If malicious user knows key AB, then they can pretend to be A. But that defeats our uh, idea of a shared secret key. KAB should be known just by B and A, not the malicious user. So in fact, symmetric key encryption provides authentication. The receiver can verify, did this message really come from A? Or did it come from someone pretending to be A? Because if it, came, if it really came from A, it will successfully decrypt with the key we shared with A. If it came from someone pretending to be A, then it will not successfully decrypt. Complex, but an important point of how we can use symmetric key encryption. Any questions about that? Try and get your head around the concept there because it's, it's used throughout uh, different schemes for authentication. And we're working on some assumptions. So one assumption here is that a shared secret key is se indeed secret. KAB is only known by A and B. Okay, if, if other people know it, then our system fails. The other thing we assume is that if a message is encrypted with one key, but decrypted with, and then the ciphertext is decrypted with a different key, then that will return an error. That will say, error, something went wrong. And you will try that with OpenSSL and other software. Uh, if you decrypt with the wrong key, usually the software will say something's gone wrong. Okay. You'll see how that's done. But it's, it's normal that that can be detected. Therefore, we can prevent or we can detect if a malicious user sends us a message pretending to be someone else. Okay. So we cannot prevent them from sending the message but we can detect if they do send the message, which is, acts as a deterrent. So when so I received those emails last week, then what I really needed is some way to authenticate who really sent the message. Although I looked at the from address of the email, I thought it was from that person, but in fact it was from someone else pretending to be that person. One way I could detect that it's from the wrong person, is to require the sender to use some form of symmetric key encryption of the message. So that's one way to authenticate. The problem with this, it, it works, it's fine. It provides authentication. The problem is that sometimes it's too slow to encrypt the entire message. We don't need to encrypt the message. Sometimes we don't care if someone sees the contents, we just want to make sure that we can verify the sender. Like our email, I don't care if the message is seen by others, I just want to make sure that the person who sent it is who they say they are. So sometimes we don't need encryption and it's slow and expensive 
cost or in, in terms of performance. So there are other ways to do the same authentication but uh, as an alternative to encryption. So symmetric key encryption can be used for authentication. However, often we want to use some other approach because symmetric key encryption is mainly for confidentiality. It can provide authentication as well. But there's some overhead of using it. It, it reduces the performance. So there are other methods built just for authentication. Uh, message authentication codes we'll go through next week and hash functions we'll go through next week. So we'll look at how, how else can we perform authentication. I think let's stop there on, the, on that rather complex part. So what will you do before Tuesday? You will do the you'll try the online quiz to make sure that you know what's going on with the, the original lectures. So try the security concepts. Again, not assessed, just try it. And more importantly, you'll do exercise one in and the main things, try and set up this virtual networking using VirtualBox. Because if you can get it set up, then we'll use it for the rest of the semester. And if you don't have access to a computer, then use the computers in the Mac lab. They're already set up. And if you have problems with it, the best thing is to take a screenshot of the error or what happened and, and email it to me or to come and show me on your laptop and I may be able to suggest the solution. Some things will go wrong. And once you've set it up, start a virtual machine, start one of the nodes and you can run OpenSSL. And the instructions for running OpenSSL, again, you've got some in your handouts and linked on the website, some, some examples and demos of running OpenSSL. Still got three minutes, good. One last demo then. Let's encrypt something. Uh, we have some plain text message in a file. Okay. Um, let's just quickly use OpenSSL to encrypt it. OpenSSL, and it's quite a complex command, so I provide some examples. Encrypt. Choose the cipher. Uh, let's use DES as the first case. Okay, you can choose any cipher. DES is insecure, but just as an example. And we need to choose the mode of operation with DES. The mode I've chosen is ECB. If you don't choose it, if you don't specify, there will be a default value chosen. What's my input? My plain text message is the input, so we specify the input message, dash in. And the output ciphertext we specify to go into some file. Now, the, when we encrypt, we, even though it's an input text message, it won't be text as an output. Uh, you can call the extension whatever you like. I'll just call it dot bin for binary. Uh, enter. All right, we need a key. And the way the software works is that if you don't provide it, your own key, it will allow you to choose a password, ask you to verify the password you typed in. So I typed it in, it didn't show. And it will use, a special, or use its own algorithm to take that password and generate a key. Okay, so it generates a key from the password, encrypts, and then we have the ciphertext as the output. Uh, So my input plain text file and the ciphertext is an output. If you try and look in the ciphertext, it's a binary, random characters. So it doesn't make sense to look at the ASCII form. Uh, you may need to use some special software to look at the ciphertext, say in binary form or in hexadecimal. XXD is one example that does that. So there's my ciphertext in hexadecimal. Okay. 
doesn't make sense in it. As ASCII, it's random characters. So uh, we want to decrypt. The operation is still encrypt, but we use an option dash D, the opposite, decrypt. We want the same algorithm. The input now is the ciphertext, and the output, let's call it the received message. In decrypt the ciphertext, I need to provide the same password. I type it in, and I look at the received message and it should be the same as the original message and it is in this case okay so I take start with a plain text message just some text message I encrypted and got some ciphertext some random characters it looks like then I decrypted the ciphertext and where here decrypted the ciphertext and put the output in receive.txt which of course is the same as the original plaintext. The message decrypted should be the same as the plaintext. And it doesn't have to be a text file, you can tr encrypt any file. You encrypt a DVD image, you encrypt a, 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 a Word document, any file that you like you can encrypt in this approach. And you can try some different options. So those instructions, are, you've got some printed in your, in your lab manual, in your lecture notes and the links to them are on the course website. You'll see links to those exact instructions for doing that. Try them. And next week we'll continue with different parts of cryptography, authentication.